use the Q&A function on screen and at the end of the presentation, we'll put your questions directly to the presenter. This, this session is all about listening and learning and looking for opportunities. So let's get started. Our first presenter is Gary Roloff, Managing Director of Layby, ASX code LBY, which has a market cap of $13.9 million. Layby is a fast growing BNPL provider with a market leading position in New Zealand and the United Kingdom and a growing presence in Australia. Gary, over to you. Hi, David. Thanks very much for having me and Happy New Year, everybody. I hope you have had a, a great festive season. Look, what I thought I'd do is just run you through the Q2 results that we presented to the market back in November and give you a little bit of an update as best I can through the continuous disclosure regime of how things have tracked through Q3 because we have our 4C announcement due at the end of this month. So if we could just skip through the disclaimer slide, please, David, and we'll um, go straight to the highlights. And I guess the one I'm really, really keen to emphasize here is the improvement in our income, up 28% quarter on quarter or around $3 million from Q1 and um, somewhere in close to up $4 million on the quarter of Q2, FY22, up some 34%. So really strong income growth that we are experiencing and continuing to experience. As we mentioned, that with our net transaction margin improving 260 basis points to 4%, we considered that a peak at 4 We think our NTM will settle somewhere between 3 and 4%, and that is consistent with what we are seeing in the Q3 numbers that um, we're reviewing right now. I think a couple of really important numbers yet to cover off here. Obviously, our EBITDA improving by uh, 270 basis points to a small negative 1.3%, and our gross losses improving markedly uh, down 130 basis points to 1.5%. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the UK defaults in a subsequent slide, but you can see the significant improvement in the UK, our growth engine uh, with default rates down a big 277 basis points. Why is GMV per customer important to us at 14% improvement? It's because we have stepped away from the vanity metrics of active consumers and active merchants. We are after quality, and that is quality in the consumer book that we operate and quality in the merchants that we onboard. And I'll talk a little bit more, more about that shortly. Can we just go to the next slide, please, David? Our strategy on achieving profitability has been unchanged for the last 12 months and all about three key pillars. Saving to invest, which is largely self-explanatory. Any savings that we are making in the company through improved operational process or procedure. And of course, the tough decisions we had to make in July to uh, downsize our team have been invested back into the business to make our platform provide a better service for our consumers and our merchants. As I alluded on the previous slide, this is all about us increasing the quality of our customers and our merchants. What do I mean by that? Well, you will see in some subsequent slides, we have intentionally removed thousands of bad acting consumers from our platform. And similarly, hundreds of merchants that we have identified as bad actors as well. That means we are trading on a GMV that is richer in terms of NTM and revenue than previously, hence the numbers you saw before. The final pillar in our strategy is all around the reduction in fraudulent activity and credit risk, uh, credit loss. We have invested a lot of money and people and processes, and we continue to invest in systems. And you'll see the evidence of those efforts in some subsequent slides. Next one, please. So here's a few key metrics that we'll run through if we just go to the next slide, thanks. So as I said, very strong growth in income, as you can see, up 3.2 million on Q1 and up almost 4 million on Q2 FY22. Our quarterly NTM has had a massive improvement. And as I say, peaking at 4% in our view. And importantly, that operating EBITDA um, both in dollar terms 
and as a percentage of GMV is showing very marked improvement. If we go to our next slide. This is where I'd like to spend a little bit of time because one of the key drivers of improved NTM, of course, is that improvement in default rate. And as you can see, our group defaults have fallen from a peak of 4.57% to 2.05. More importantly, by region, you can see how we have rapidly um, and significantly got our default rate in the UK under control. Um, it was worrying at that point at that point of 6.06, .06, as you might appreciate, but certainly at 2.39%, a massive improvement, and we are continuing to see that improving trend over the course of the last three months. Um, New Zealand and Australia has never been a major issue for us in terms of defaults. A little bit of an increase there, which we are putting down to the macroeconomic situation that all consumers are feeling right now with the cost of living increases. Our orders per active customer in the UK are significantly higher than those in Australasia, and that is down to the fact that we have an affiliate program in the UK that provides access for our consumers to the top 500 UK, UK retailers. As I've alluded, GMV per customer is up 270 basis points, uh, which is a, a very big increase year on year. Go to the next slide. Just um, showing you where we're stabilizing our GMV. As I said, we are not about focusing on what I do term vanity, uh, vanity <laughs> metrics, which is active customers and active merchants. The simple fact is last year when we were uh, being encouraged by the market to grow at any cost, active customers was a key metric the market was looking at. Active customers are defined as those who have shopped in the last 12 months. We know going in, knew going into Q3 that we had attracted a lot of bad actors prior to Christmas 2021. That would drop off our database because they only shop once, they were defaulters or fraudulent actors, and we've wiped them off our platform. So I'm not at all concerned about where we're tracking in terms of active customers, active merchants. My focus is all about quality GMV. If we go to the next slide, please. And as you can see in the um, United Kingdom, our UK GMV per customer continues on the trajectory that we have been looking for, and we're very happy with how we're performing in the UK. As I alluded, Q3 of FY22, prior to Christmas last year, we onboarded a massive amount of bad actors, which drove that 87 million pounds in that quarter. We had every expectation of that being lower this year, and as a result, fewer active customers, because a large portion of that 87 million were bad actors. We go on to the next slide, please. Same goes for Australia and New Zealand. Uh, in New Zealand in Q3 last year, Auckland, our largest city and largest catchment was still in lockdown. So we gained the benefit of that COVID increase through October, November and December. Um, that obviously wasn't the same this year, um, but Q2 was still a solid quarter for us across both those jurisdictions. And again, our GMV per customer is continuing to track where we want it to. Next slide, please. Supporting us, we have two very good partners uh, providing the debt support for our debtors ledger. Partners for Growth have been a fantastic support for us in the UK and continue to provide that support as we work in that UK market and look to grow further with a quality book. Similarly, Kiwi Bank here in New Zealand, long supporters of Layby have been with us since 2017 and have been a terrific support for myself, the board and the management team. So we're very blessed with the partners we have on our debt facilities and I can't speak highly enough of them. Go to our next slide, please. Next one, thanks. So look, from an outlook perspective, um, nothing much has changed in terms of where we're at today than where we were back in November. We're reaffirming our, our commitment to achieving profitability by the end of this financial year. We had a small positive EBITDA that we achieved in September, and we have had a very solid performance over the course of Q3. More to come on that, obviously, with our 4C announcement. 
As I mentioned, our NTM, we expect to normalize between three and 4%. The Q2 performance was a peak. I don't expect NTM to be at 4% for Q3. I don't expect it to be below three either, but all I'm saying is four was a peak. Uh, those anticipated savings of $20 million as a result of what we've been doing through our restructure have been invested back into the business and they are supporting that pathway to profitability. What I would highlight that we alluded to back in November is that we do see the inevitable post-Christmas hangover kicking in already in January across all three markets. That is seasonal, that is anticipated. And I think when you consider the hangover from Christmas on top of the general malaise in the economies around the world, that is not unexpected at all to see the um, softer GMV numbers. And we do, we, having said that, we don't expect that to um, impact our profitability adversely at all. We have continued our tight approach to credit risk uh, when we go through uh, our onboarding of consumers, very mindful of that macroeconomic area. And as I say, we do have an expectation that we'll be profitable and self-sustaining by the end of our 2023 financial year. So look, I'm very happy to take any questions you may have. David, I'll pass the mic back to you. Gary, thanks. And a great presentation. And and um, not a, a pivot's a wrong word, but you've clearly uh, taken some very strong and proactive steps in uh, reshaping the business and aligning the business to profitability. Um, and in some respects, decoupled a little bit from what the market expected of you or expects of you from a growth point of view and uh, looked at a sustainable model uh, that will drive the business profitably and successfully going forward. Um, a question just in terms of profit. So um, you've, you've obviously put the number out there saying that you believe you'll be there by year end. Is is that, uh, are you comfortable that you're tracking towards that goal? Yeah. Yes, I am. Yeah. And when you get there, the initiatives that you've used to get yourself to profitability, do those initiatives start to lessen a little or do they just ramp up or stay the same? They actually ramp up, David, because we've got a couple of new things we'll be rolling out over the course of this calendar year that will actually enhance our profitability. We've also exited a couple of areas of the business that we're not delivering on any sort of ROI that we wanted. I can't um, articulate that at this point because we need to run that through the normal channels as an ASX listed business. But the improvements that we are seeing are definitely sustainable and in fact are improving. And in terms of the um, uh, the, the buy now, pay later sector um, has clearly seen changes and, and some companies have just dropped away because they haven't taken that proactive stance. How do you think the sector the sector looks in three, six, 12 months from here or even longer? Oh, look, I think the sector is providing a service that consumers are embracing globally. And sometimes down this part of the world, we could become somewhat shielded from the fact that in the Northern Hemisphere, buy now, pay later remains in its relative infancy. So I think there's a lot of runway left there yet. You know, we at Layby um, have sustained our performance in the UK, have continued to grow in the UK. We've watched some other participants choose to exit that market. We're very proud to be recognised as one of the top three in the UK market, and we continue to have confidence in our ability to stay there. So I think buy now, pay later is here to stay as a payment method. I just think that inevitably everyone has to evolve and um, we're doing that. And I have no doubt at all that our competitor set will be evolving also. How do you see growth going forward? Obviously you touched on in your presentation that, that it was a growth at all costs uh, model, largely because that's what the market was expecting of you. Um, and now you've reshaped to be uh, focused on profit and sustainable profit going forward. Does that does that lessen your growth going forward or does it just match it more to, to where the business is and sizes to where the business is and at that point in time? Yeah, David, um, we are still growing. We're just not in a hyper growth mode that costs you a lot of money. 
you know, I, I have a retail background for as a CEO for 16 years. I'm not used to running companies that lose money. I, ne I never have until we started this one and it was a growth business and the expectation was you did. Um, we are focused on being a profitable business, a self-sustaining business, so that our requirements for capital come from our internal resources, not external. And is that early growth, and as you said, there was a hyper growth phase there, but was that early, that early growth surely was very important to giving you the foundation now to build your profitable business? Oh, yes, it was. I think, you know, um, we're all very wise with the benefit of hindsight, aren't we? And, uh, you know, uh, we unquestionably got turbocharged through COVID. Um, as a result of that, you know, we grew 500% year on year in the UK from 20 to 21 uh, and another 100% from 21 to 22. I would have liked to have seen that with the benefit of hindsight growing at, say, 200% year on year as opposed to 600 over two years. Understandable. A great outlook clearly focused on profitability, matching the company and its operations to the profitable growth that you're looking to achieve. Gary, clearly a hidden gem to watch uh, in 2023. Thanks for your time and we look forward to following the story. Thank you, David. And um, we'll talk to you again soon. Happy New Year. Bye. Look forward to it. Our next presenter is Mike Dunbar, Managing Director of Western Australian Focus Gold, Nickel and Copper, Ex Copper Explorer, Mamba Exploration, ASX code M24, which has a market cap of approximately $10 million. Mike, welcome, and we look forward to hearing more about the company and its recent exploration activities. Great. Thanks very much, David, and uh, thanks for all the listeners. And I reiterate, uh, I hope everyone had a uh, uh, enjoyable Christmas break and are ready for a very busy 2023. We certainly are, and we're very active and very busy in, in our exploration. Um, so you go through to the, disclaim the disclaimer slide. Um, <clears throat> you can read that at your discretion. Um, having a bit of a look, and really this is an introduction to Mamba. Um, so we have deliberately focused on Western Australian assets when we formed the company in late 2020, and we listed in February of 2021. So we we're about two years old. Um, we've got a, a small team, uh, but a very dedicated team working very hard on our, on our, on our projects. Total shares on issue is around 61 million shares. I mean, as Dave mentioned, mark capitalization around about the $10 million mark with $2.7 million in cash at the end of Q, Q, uh, Q1 of, of this financial year, uh, giving an enterprise value of around about $7 million. So um, yeah, we've been, as the title would suggest, a hidden gem. So moving to the next slides really, and this is a bit of a, a summary of where our projects are in Western Australia. And quite deliberately, we've got summer projects in the southern part of Western Australia, which we can work during, as the name would suggest, the cricket season or the summer, summer months. Um, and down there, we have the Hyden project, which we've recently just acquired under, under an option, the Darling Range project, and the Great Southern Gold project as well. So three projects that we can work during the summer months. Uh, and then very deliberately in the in the winter months, uh, when it's difficult to to work in the southern wet part of Western Australia, we move to the to the, the Kimberley and the Ashburton project um, up in the northern part of Western Australia. Now that part is very very prospective, but very seasonal. Uh, and as a lot of people I'm sure would have seen in the news recently, uh, the seasonal flooding that we've seen there, this flooding has been far more substantial than most years. But um, you do see seasonal floods and seasonal rain events in the north, so we need to need to keep ourselves busy with very deliberately a, a northern and southern um, exploration project style, so we can work on both areas year round and pro provide news flow year round. So moving through the southern projects uh, at the moment, that's where our, where our focus is, and the project that we acquired in November uh, under option, which is actually a rare earth project. Um, it's rare earths are, are um, certainly on the critical, critical metals lists for most uh, governments around the world at the moment um, and very, very uh, sought after and, and needed for the decarbonisation of, of the economy going forward. So looking at the project itself and the Hyden project, uh, most people wouldn't know where Hyden is, but it's around about 300 kilometres to the east of Perth in the, in the wheat belt of Western Australia. In the project that we acquired, uh, we got four 
um, granted expiration licenses uh, and the rare earth rights to all of all of those tenements. Uh, and on top of that, we we pegged in 100% in our own right five new expiration licenses around them. Uh, the areas had very very little expiration for rare earth um, elements in the past, um, and really the one highlight was uh, there were only three samples taken and, and assayed for a full suite of of rare earth elements to date by uh, by the vendors of the project. We identified a very very high grade clay sample of 46,000 plus change uh, parts per million of total rare earths, which is incredibly high for, for um, clay hosted um, mineralization. And we now need to understand what that means. Uh, the other really interesting part, part about rare earths and, and not that many people know about much about them, they are very niche. Um, there's a very high proportion in that drill sample of um, heavy rare earths, which are the, as the name will suggest, the heavier end of the, the rare earth spectrum, uh, with around 37% of the total rare earths being heavy rare earths. Also, the NDPR um, accounts for around 26%. Now, NDPR is important for permanent magnets, um, and that's, that uh, equates for around about 26% of, of the total rare earths. So very, very interesting and high, uh, high grade heavy rare earth and, and uh, NDPR. Interestingly enough, this is only part of the story. Um, the clay mineralization we've identified is part of the story. There's also a very significant um, gravity anomaly that we've identified from regional data just to the east of that sampling. And that really provides another, another target and another style of mineralization that we're exploring for. We're going to the next slide. Um, so why have we got grades of this kind of magnitude uh, in the area? And the answer is we don't know. Uh, it's a bit too honest for some people, but really that's the, that's the truth. Most clay deposits are around about 800 ppm to 2000 ppm. So this at 46,000 is incredibly high. That could be one of three reasons could explain that. Um, the first one, uh, we may just have stumbled across the highest grade rare earth clay deposit globally. Now, I think the chances of that are incredibly unlikely, but that is a possibility. Um, I don't think that's gonna be the case, however. The second option uh, of to explain that high grade is there's graphite has been mapped and drilled nearby. And graphite quite often can be a, a sink, a metal sink, if you like, for all metals, but could be a, a sink for the rare earths as well. So that could explain uh, locally why we've seen higher grade uh, total rare earths. The other option uh, is there may actually be a bedrock source of rare earths that, that um, are creating these very high grades. Now that's that's a really interesting potential uh, and a, an interesting option. Um, and that's part of the reason I mentioned the gravity anomaly, which is off to the, to the east of the, the area that's been drilled. Um, so that, that could be the source. Now that's a little bit unknown at this stage. Um, and that's why we're doing the drilling at the moment. Uh, and we've commenced a serve a drill campaign there, um, testing the, the distribution of the, the clay mineralization, uh, as well as a detailed gravity survey over the gravity anomaly to the east to better understand the reason for the high grades and where what is controlling them. So moving to the next slide, you can see three separate images here. On the left-hand side, it's, that's the geological mapping um, and the, the drilling that the, our vendors that we've acquired the option from had done targeting the graphite. And you can see the graphite is in the GT in red there. Um, and you can see the, the location of the gravity anomaly just to the east of that in white. The central image is a magnetic image, total magnetic intensity. Uh, and you can see again, again, a magnetic feature running associated with that gravity anomaly. And on the right hand side, the gravity data, regional gravity data itself. So that anomaly is around about 2.8 kilometers by 2.2 kilometers. So we need to understand that system better before we, we start drilling that system. That's why we're doing the gravity survey at the moment. So moving to the next slide um, and the next project, the Darling Range project. Um, now I'm sure a lot of um, the viewers or listeners would have um, seeing the, the discoveries and, and 
phenomenal growth that um, Chalice have had uh, discovering the, the Julemar um, deposit just outside of Perth. Well, our Darling Range project, if you go to the next slide, is around about 30 kilometres from the Julemar discovery just outside of Perth in, in the western portion of the wheat belt. Now, on the image on the right hand side, you can see the Julemar project and the trend chalice's um, magnetic trend running through that, uh, that state forest area in red. Where we are is around 30 kilometres further to the northwest and northeast, rather. Uh, and we've identified a six kilometre long trend uh, running through our tenement package. So, moving to the next slide, and you can see a couple of images here. On the left hand side, they've got a six kilometre long uh, PGE, so platinum group element um, anomaly that can be traced through the, the, the farmer's paddocks. Um, on the right hand side, you can we've identified ultramafic and mafic rocks that run and follow that trend. And then uh, on top of that, uh, gravity anomalies as well. So really quite an interesting target. We've tested the northern one. Uh, we're yet to test. We've just got ground access to the south and we're drilling that. Uh, sorry, um, done ground EM. Uh, that modelling is now underway and drilling uh, is scheduled for this month as well. So we're very active on that area. Um, very quickly moving to the Southern Great Southern project, uh, our third of our um, summer projects, uh, funnily enough, is in the Great Southern. Uh, the, that's the geological, geological map. And you can see in that area uh, a four kilometre long trend. We've been focused and drilling on an area just in the, the southern prospect. And there's an image there. Um, if you click to the next, just move forward a little bit, in, just in that box there, is the drilling that we completed in November of last year. Um, excuse me. That drilling is has been completed uh, and we're now waiting for assays. But just zooming on that, on that area in particular, that's a four kilometre long trend running through that area. Now just click forward a little bit. So there's a four kilometre long soil anomaly. We've soil sampled that, got up to 2.8 grams per tonne and a lot of other high grades in soils. We've only drilled a very small portion of the southern part of that, uh, 32 holes drilled early last year. And, um, and, uh, and, excuse me, uh, and a lot of mineralization identified, very shallow as well. So next slide, you can see that, that drilling, um, very shallow drilling to the north. Um, moving forward up to the, the winter project, so the, the Kimberley project, I'll only talk about Copper Flats. It's a large tenement package running from the Northern Territory border off to near Halls Creek. Next slide. It's a very large tenement package, as I mentioned, uh, and really we're exploring and focusing just on the right-hand side there on the Eastern part, part of that, uh, that area to the, to the Northeast. Next slide. So we've got a number of separate targets for mineralization in the area. The surface sampling has identified some very high grade copper. If you move through the next animation, you'll see a number of magnetic features that we've identified and, and traced. Uh, we're now doing soil sampling on the next image. You'll see some soil sampling in the, across to the east and then a large area of, of EM that we are flying this, this year. So in summary, uh, we've got uh, a number of projects. The summer projects are our current focus with Hyden. Uh, we've secured the project. We're doing a gravity survey at the moment and drilling at the moment. At Darling Range, we've completed some ground EM. That modelling's been undertaken now and moving towards uh, diamond drilling this month. The Great Southern, we did some more drilling in November, waiting for assays, uh, and then further drilling probably in, the, in Q1, of, so Q2 of this year. And the Kimberley, while it's currently very wet up there, uh, we've got a lot of exploration planned and large EM survey planned for this year as well. So we've got a lot going on. Um, this start to, to January has probably been um, uh, relatively quiet for a lot of people in the exploration game. For us, it's been the opposite. Uh, we've really been very, very active and an ex a very exciting time for, for us moving forward. So David, uh, I'll pass the mic, mic back to you. Sorry, David, I can't hear you. 
<laughs> no, sorry about that. That was me. Um, thanks, uh, Mike, for a great presentation. Clearly, uh, a company that is very systematic with its exploration, a very clear dual strategy um, with the northern and the southern projects, and, and a lot has been done, but a lot to be done. How active, like you said, January's been very active, but how active uh, do you suspect the next 12 months will be, and, and how much how much work is going to be going into the into the drill programs across the portfolio? Yeah, interesting, interesting question. Look, we we have had, uh, as I think a lot of junior explorers and junior uh, companies have, the, the infancy of the company life is challenging, uh, and we did have a challenge in twenty uh, late twenty twenty one and, and mid twenty twenty two, but now we're really hitting our straps and being more far more active. The southern area because. A lot of the, their projects are under cover, sorry, I'm under farms. Um, we are act limited as to when we can get access to those farms because of the, we don't want to interfere with, with the, the farmers' grain production. Um, so we're really busy when they've, after they've harvested uh, and before they, they put the next year's crop in. So we're very, very busy in the southern targets now. We'll be drilling, we have drilled in the great southern area this uh, in November. We will be drilling in the first half of this year down there, drilling at uh, Hyden now um, and Gravity now. I think there'll be another drill program there um, before May. Um, the Darling Range project drilling, now we've been um, hampered by, by uh, land access. Now that has largely been resolved now with uh, agreements with two farmers that will allow us to get access and, and drill those targets. So that will be happening this month, which is very exciting. Um, and so all, all lining up really well for us there. So that, that will be really active. The northern areas are going to be difficult, particularly this year. Um, the Kimberley, with the flooding and the damages, damage that's been done to uh, regional infrastructure up there, or appears to have been done, it hasn't been fully assessed yet, um, will make access up into the Kimberley far more difficult for us, probably for the first six months of this year. Um, fortunately, we're actually undertaking a, an airborne survey up there, so we'll actually be able to still undertake that activities, those activities. But drilling may be impacted by just our ability to actually get to the to site. Um, unfortunately, the, the bridge at Fitzroy Crossing, for example, is, has been damaged. That's being assessed now, and whether whether we can even get through that way, or whether we have to drive up via Northern Territory. It's a long way around. If that's what we have to do, that's what we will do. But um, it's a difficult, difficult stages right now. But we will work through that and uh, and keep busy with the drill rig, but also other exploration as well. Shareholders love news flow, exploration and drilling and other sample activities generate lots of news flow. So there will be lots of news flow coming from Mamba uh, this year. We look forward to following it with interest. Mike, thanks for your time and we'll speak to you again soon. Great. Thanks, David. And thanks for all the listeners and, uh, and FN. Financial News Network for the opportunity. Thanks. Now, changing things up a bit, we're now going to look at a high quality tech company in Drone Shield, ASX code DRO, which has a market cap of in excess of $115 million. Drone Shield provides artificial intelligence based platforms for protection against advanced threats such as drones and autonomous systems. Joining us today is Oleg Vornik, CEO and MD. Oleg, over to you. Thank you, David. Oleg Vornik, CEO of Drone Shield. We are at an inflection point, having announced a record $11 million order this week, previously followed by another $11 million contract that we released in December. Drone Shield is an eight year old company making counter drone products that do detection and defeat of small drones, the likes of you can find in JB Hi Fi for a couple thousand bucks used for such applications like warfare, terrorism, smuggling of contraband, and, and so forth. We listed about six years ago and have been posting record results year on year, but now we're really going through the breakout phase. David, slide, please. And slide. Uh, so the first slide talks about why drones present such a threat. As the drone technology continues to rapidly evolve, like any technology, the flying times, navigation capability, payloads, cameras, swarming, along with all the positive applications come nefarious uses. In Ukraine, we're seeing both sides use small drones for scouting out the battlefield, 
directing artillery strikes and dropping charges. We've been involved on the Ukrainian side since the start of the war, since the military, as by the military aid programs, and are pleased to be making difference, taking down the Russian drones. Intelligence gathering is another big item. So similar how you might use it in war zone, in a more civilian setting in a corporate scenario, you might have corporate espionage, surveillance, etc. Nuisance, as you might have seen, Gatwick Airport was shut down in December 2018 with a couple of drones flying around, stopping all traffic. The reason why all flights need to stop when a drone is detected around the airport is if a drone gets ingested by the uh, plane engine that can burn down the engine and, and take down the airliner. So today it's a significant threat and we've been making steady progress in deploying at airports, including our very first US airport in late last year. Cyber ransom attacks. So cyber gets uh, a lot of publicity these days. Drones can be used for cyber attacks, for example, landing on control decks of ships and using proximity to hack into the controls and demanding ransom or otherwise the uh, direction be to run the ship onto the ground, for example. Slide, please. Three streams to our business. The core stream is our counter drone work where we are pioneer and the global leader in this rapidly emerging space, both hardware sales and the SaaS subscriptions. So as you buy most of our products, with them come trailing software subscriptions as new drone types emerge. We issue software updates to the en software engines that run on those devices. And while SaaS is relatively small part of our total revenue, it was approximately 5% in 2021, and we're about to release our 2022 results. We run on December year end. As I think about our next five year plan, we hope that close to half of total revenues will be eventually derived via the SAS. The next adjacent field is artificial intelligence in electronic warfare. So that can be seen as very similar to counter drone, looking for never seen before signals in the radio frequency space. We are currently doing a $3.8 million contract with the Australian Department of Defense and expecting a follow-up large contract in the near term, as well as similar work in the US. And lastly, we're doing artificial intelligence work in the computer vision, where we just finished an $800,000 contract with the Australian Department of Defense, essentially using a camera to track complex objects using our computer vision technology. And we expect that to lead to another contract, but also we're embedding it in our core counter drone products. Slide, please. Three steps to the counter drone system. First one is detection. It's often very difficult to detect a quiet small drone, especially at night. Our systems are able to provide reliable detection multiple kilometers away, and you can daisy chain the sensors to have very wide area surveillance, such as border. Assessment is usually the next step where you want to make sure you understand where the drone is, where the pilot is, and we're able to provide that information in real time, as you're seeing on the screenshot in the middle on the top. And then response is then the last step. So sometimes you may want to take the drone down, maybe if you are in a in a war, for example, and we give safe defeat option by smart jamming, where you're disorienting the drone using our jammers, handhelds, vehicle-based or fixed side systems, and then taking the drone down or swarm of drones down without damaging the drones. Or sometimes you may wish to not take the drone down, like for example, with our prison customers, and instead we can report in real time location of the drone pilot and also track and identify who picks up the package and apprehend the participants and conduct investigation and, and solve the issue. Slide, David. The way we see our company is an AI or artificial intelligence platform for protection against drones. This is because while we do hardware as our core offering with all of the hardware or with almost all of our hardware come that SaaS subscription running on AI engine and that's where the real smarts are. So we develop and market and manufacture both our hardware and software, but the, the real brains and, and the real money in the long term is in the software running on our devices. The second item is leverage to the global defense and security sector. The unfortunate truth is that we're living in an increasingly uncertain world. People are realizing that wars are a thing as underscored by Ukraine and, and also previously by, I guess, lesser 
prominence uh, conflicts like in Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Syria, in the Middle East, and, and, and our products and drone threats been prevalent in a lot of those places. And $10 billion counter drone addressable market is a very large opportunity for a company of our size. Sales pipeline. So as I mentioned, we closed to over 20 million or, or, or accepted over $20 million uh, worth of contracts in the last month alone. And we have approximately $200 million qualified pipeline with over 90 projects around the world. In addition to that, we have a couple hundred of additional opportunities uh, through the all the work we've been doing in the last few years as a company. We have Australian Department of Defense, US Department of Defense, US Department of Homeland Security, a number of other tier one customers around the world. The reason I say this is one, it demonstrates the quality of the company and of our products. And secondly, these are not the kind of customers who purchase million bucks worth of products and that's sufficient for them. The idea is you start to iterate into higher, repeat higher value contracts. So as I think about our company evolution in the beginning, we started eight years ago with development of our technology, with our team, with our distributor network in about 100 countries around the world. Then we moved to demonstrations, smaller sales, repeat smaller sales, larger one or two million dollar sales, repeat million dollar plus sales. Then our first maiden $11 million contract in December last year, and now repeat 10 million plus contracts that we're sitting at the moment. And uh, 2023 is looking like another record year for us already. And importantly, the last point, most of our revenue is derived by repeat customers, which is, which is quite critical and, and is a testament to the product as well. Slide, please. I'll skip through the warrior slide. You guys can read it afterwards. Slide, please. This chart talks about our revenue and cash receipt evolution. So we've been posting record results every year. In December, we released to ASX that we're expecting another record 2022. We're out on calendar year end. And the results will be, some of the results will be released as part of our 4C at the end of this month. And then the remaining results with our annual report at the end of February. Slide, please. So to recap some of our achievements in the last 12 months, two all-time record $11 million orders, recommendation by the U.S. Department of Defense for rollout of our products across the defense bases across the U.S. So this is very important. It was a very highly contested competition running over about 12 months where a single agency, part of the U.S. Army, was tasked with identifying a recommended counter-drone solution for deployment across numerous bases in the US. Three consortia were selected and we were one of them and we expect this to be a very meaningful source of revenue starting from this year. First US airport deployment, as I mentioned, and in the US you have over 10,000 airports. So we believe that this would be the first step towards falling dominoes as we do more airports in the US, but also elsewhere globally. And we already have a couple other airports around the world where we're deployed. Deployments at Davos and Ironman, we've done Olympics, Sea uh, Games, Commonwealth Games. To be frank, those high profile events are not incredible money spinners, but they provide really good publicity and awareness for our customers. Most recently, we've been reported in early January, about a week ago, using our, our Brazilian's presidential security, using our drone gun system to protect against drones infiltrating the presidential inauguration in Brazil and successfully taking down those drones. So that's really priceless publicity. Numerous million plus dollar deployments with various government customers. Government customers are notoriously difficult to break into. It can take several years and we're now at the point where all the hard work is done. And the great thing about dealing with those people is because it's so difficult to break in, they're also incredibly sticky, meaning once you have them, so long as you continue meeting their requirements, you more or less have them for life. So we're excited to continue working with those customers to be getting repeat orders. So when I think about repeat revenues in the drone show context, it's essentially two things. One, repeat orders with the same customer, and two, the software service subscription. And then the last highlighted point on this page, in November last year, a couple of months ago, we took a 3.7 million investment from Epris, 
Epirus is a US defense technology unicorn focused on high powered microwaves doing hard defeat of drones. So frying electric circuits inside the drone or what's known as hard defeat in the industry. We're very complementary where we provide detection and jamming known as soft defeat. And then we've been working with them on the US Department of Defense rollout. So that corresponded to approximately a 4% stake in drone shield at the time, and we're continuing actively to collaborate with Epirus. Slide, please. Slide, please. So geopolitical environment are largely covered, um, but to maybe put some specific numbers, we are looking at record peacetime budgets in a number of countries like US DOD passing an $800 billion budget, Germany increasing budget to over 2% of GDP. Germany has been very much a low defense budget nation since World War II, but now with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, this is rapidly changing and they're investing an enormous amount of money to modernize the military. And of course, counter drone is a very important part of the modern warfare. I heard uh, somebody in defense say that count drones and counter drone today are similar in impact as body armor was in World War I, to give, uh, to give a sense. If you are, for example, in a urban warfare kind of situation and you have your enemy a few buildings down, you can't just throw a grenade over, but you can certainly send a drone over to scout out the situation and potentially drop charge. So with that drone technology, you have a need for counter drone technology because you can't simply just discharge a rifle, for example. It's very difficult to detect and defeat drones using conventional technologies and you need specialized technologies like what Drone Shield offers. Slide, please. Slide, please. Thank you. So in addition to the military, there are significant non-defense applications for what we do, such as protection of government facilities. So I mentioned the presidential inauguration in Brazil, for example. Law enforcement, we're already supplied to a number of law enforcement agencies in Australia, in the US and around the world. So the application there will be to provide terrorism protection, to be called to sensitive sites, uh, to pro uh, protect crowd gatherings and, and so on. Uh, airports, we covered stadiums, so drones can often disrupt games by flying into middle of the field or even uh, given its big public gatherings, it's a ripe sort of situation for a terrorism attack or even discharging white powder over the top of the crowd, creating stampede using a drone. So we provide systems that provide protection against such situations. Energy production. So we already started supplying to critical infrastructure and, and, and you guys might have already seen that in Australia, there was a bill passed by the parliament last year requiring critical infrastructure owners to be very careful with making sure that they assess the all different types of threats that might be facing their facilities. So if you look at these big cooling stacks in the uh, in the image, if you are, say, a terrorist or a Greenpeace activist or, or similar, you might be taking a drone even without payload, flying it over such cooling stack, dropping it down. You have to shut down the whole power station for potentially weeks, conduct investigation. You have enormous amount of cost damage and so on. So nuclear, but also more conventional infrastructure and energy production owners are very mindful of the counter drone threats. High profile events. So we've done Olympics, Com Games, etc. in the past, as I mentioned, not huge money spinner, but great for marketing. And then probably I'll skip through over the next couple, but correctional facilities. So prisons developed a very good way of stopping people infiltrating via the ground, but they're essentially defenseless from air. So starting from several years ago, criminals been delivering contraband, think cell phones, escape kits, cigarettes, weapons right into the uh, inmate cell windows using drones. So it's a very, very significant need for prisons. It's a $10 billion addressable market today across all different types of facilities. Slide, please. And slide. This is the last slide I'll present to. There are a number of other slides in the pack. Three different families of products that we offer being dismounted products, the drone guns that you would basically point at a drone, you press the trigger, it sends radio frequency signal which overwhelms the drone, the drone safely lands. RF patrol is the companion device which enables you to detect 
So it's drone first before you take it down. Then the next family is our drone Sentry X, which is vehicle, ship, or fixed site based combined detection and defeat device. And then lastly, drone Sentry, the base protection device using different types of sensors like radio frequency, radars, cameras, and then the jammers for the defeat that you would put around a sensitive site to provide a bubble of protection around it. So what's on the left in orange is our hardware and inside the hardware sits the software like our subscription-based RF engines, the command and control systems and the drone opt ID, which is our camera focused software. So maybe just to clarify also on the IP, aside from the hardware of the cameras and the radars, which plain to people do, everything else you see on the slide is 100% generated by, created by Drone Shield. We have a team of about 40 engineers, 60 people altogether, 15 in Sydney and 10 in the US, and all of the IP belongs to us. We're not relying on any third-party IP. That in turn means that our products are unique, highly differentiated, and we're able to charge very high margins for the products that we sell now in increasing quantities. I'll stop there and take questions, David. Thanks, Oleg. A great, uh, a, a really interesting company and very topical, obviously, but uh, more than topical, a very um, uh, growth focused and, and a company that's making great strides uh, across the various sectors in which you operate. A couple of questions, because we're a bit tight for time, but a couple of questions. There's a lot of opportunity and the, the pipeline is massive. How do you scale up to meet that demand? We have our own production uh, facility in Sydney, as well as two outsourced production facilities over the top of that. We spent a lot of time making sure we're scalable through both how we build, meaning we have a number of supply chain partners. Uh, so people that do stuff that we do not do ourselves, like CNC machining, metal bending, cable looming, and then when parts that are designed to our specifications arrive to our manufacturing or assembly facilities, putting it together is a relatively simple and very scalable task. And then we also put a lot of effort into our software deployment and make sure that we can deploy at scale. The last thing to say is that our products are not cheap. So the cheapest product we offer is in tens of thousands of dollars. And then the next step up in terms of pricing is in hundreds of thousands. And then our fixed side systems are close to a million bucks each. So you're not talking thousands upon thousands of products needing to be made before we're talking very serious revenue. And last question, competition. When the prize is so big, how competitive is the landscape and what's your competitive advantage? When we started eight years ago, there was virtually no competition. Now the market is running red hot. We're seeing competitors emerge in a number of places. We, of course, have an enormous head start by having had a lot of time to develop the products, develop the pipeline, like I was saying, having penetrated those government channels. That takes enormous amount of time and then mature the opportunities Government defense sector is not the kind of sector like consumer where you can just turn up and start selling. It's not that easy to quickly disrupt. So we have a very significant, I guess, head start. Then we're seeing, I guess, a lot of our competitors do what's easier. There might be a single product company focused on single geography. We have made a choice to cover all the different types of counter drone products, detection, defeat, handhelds, vehicle fixed side systems. And the, the last thing to say is that the counter drone market is becoming really big, meaning I actually personally welcome competition. I think of it a bit like a like high-end dining, right? You don't mind if there are other high-end restaurants around you. In fact, it promotes the market and increases customer expectations and generally improves the industry. So long as you're in top three or top five, which we certainly are anywhere around the world, there's still more than plenty of business for us. Thanks, Oleg. A interesting company that has great growth potential, playing in a big market, a big prize, already with strong relationships and contracts in place that will form a great foundation moving forward. So Oleg, thanks for your time and clearly Drone Shield, a company to watch. Thank you, David. 
Last but certainly not least is exciting exploration company Los Cerros ASX code LCL, which has a market cap of approximately 28 to $30 million. Presenting today is Managing Director Jason Sturbinskis. Jason, over to you. So we might have a little technical issue. We're just uh, bringing Jason on now. So just give us a second. How about go. now? Can you hear me now? Yep, got you. No problems at all. Thanks, Jason. Over to you. All right, thank you. Um, assuming you didn't hear the first bit, I'll say it again, David. Um, a lot has happened since last time we spoke. The most exciting development is, is by far the acquisition of a portfolio of gold, copper and nickel targets in uh, Papua New Guinea to supplement or complement our, um, our Colombian story. So that'll be the main focus of this presentation. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. So the acquisition of the PNG portfolio is a high impact strategy for us. And uh, hopefully by the end of this slide, it'll all make sense to you as to why we did this. Uh, you might uh, on the surface say, well, PNG is very different to Colombia. In, in fact, it's actually not. Um, in terms of ESG focus, um, and the geology, uh, the nature of the geology, the types of metals we're hunting uh, and various other bits and pieces. Uh, it actually is very similar to what we have in Colombia. Also in terms of where it is and its, its uh, evolution as well. Uh, historically, PNG has been the focus of tier one type companies chasing elephants and they're they focus on a certain model because they're looking for 5 million plus projects all the time. What that focus does is creates opportunities for juniors to come in and, and we're here to leverage that opportunity as we see this as a growing area in PNG in the years to come just like it was in Colombia seven years ago when we entered Colombia it was the realm of tier ones chasing elephants and that created opportunities for us to move in and discover things like Tesserito and so on the areas we have in PNG are all uh, close to um, to tier one type discoveries, which is always a good thing. Uh, it also plays to our strengths, um, and this is an important one. The Kinchia discovery in Colombia is is a mature project now. It's 2.6 million ounces, and we're going through sort of early stage engineering and those sorts of things. But our track record of success is in exploration, and we're well funded. So the um, the, the focus uh, late last year was to find a a project that sort of meets or plays to our strengths, and we reviewed many before we found. Um, uh, PNG assets uh, owned by a group called Footprint, which were well and truly under the radar for most, but uh, amazing, amazing um, uh, early stage results. It also, we believe, is timed well to the um, to money markets and commodity cycles and so on. And it also launches us into the EV battery space. So some really exciting copper and nickel targets to add to our, our gold story. And the other reason why this was so uh, compelling to us is that we saw in two of the projects the potential for very easy, um, early, quick wins and, and, and dramatic wins at two projects, one called Kusi and another one called Very, Very. And to put a number around what I mean by um, early stage dramatic, uh, that sample you see there, that's uh, taken off of an outcrop, so it's on the surface. And that, uh, it's a polished uh, polished um, sample, that grades 61.3 grams per tonne gold and 18% copper on the surface. So that gives you an idea of uh, the opportunity for quick wins here. Uh, next slide, please. So that's the distribution of the um, Colombian asset, uh, sorry, PNG assets. The red ones are, are ours, and you can see they're all sort of proximal to the big discoveries of PNG, and they sit on that major mountain building range that is the Highlands and the Owen Stanley, just like our Colombian story sits on the Andes range. So similar sorts of geology and, and um, or genesis. Next slide, please. So I want to zoom in onto the Ono project because this is getting immediate attention from us, in particular, a, a target called Kusi, which you can see there uh, in the middle of the Ono project area. It's a it's relatively short distance to Ley, which is the largest airport in PNG, and shares sort of the same sort of geological regional structures as um, the multi-million ounce Hidden Valley Mine and, uh, and Wafigolpu. Next slide, please. This is a plan view of uh, what we have at uh, Kusi. Now, this has been drilled previously, historically, and there's three holes I want to draw your attention to, and you'll see the results of these on the next slide, but uh, four, seven, and three, sort of the southern side, uh, central in this image, they uh, were drilled chasing the porphyry system that's driving this whole regional complex, uh, and they didn't hit that porphyry. 
uh, but uh, they certainly got spoke, lots of pathfinders and similar to say that it was a porphyry somewhere nearby, but they didn't actually intercept that. But what they drilled going uh, through, what they drilled through in their focus on the elephant, finding the porphyry, was this limestone scarn layer, which is really compelling. That 61 I showed you earlier is from this limestone scarn. Uh, they drilled through this layer, this sort of sub-horizontal layer, and that's what we're really interested in uh, uh, immediately in terms of a quick win and uh, and and um, uh, immediate drilling. The area we're focused on is in that southern image, so where those three drill holes are, and you can see two trenches there, 20 metres at um, 3.84 and uh, a larger one, 71, at, at nearly five grams. But um, that 71 goes along the unit, it doesn't cross the unit, so the length is a bit misleading, it's not true width or anything close to it, but the grades are obviously still perfectly valid. So what this, what those trenches are doing is they're saying, okay, if we drilled through the, the ridge of this mountain, and uh, if it's a sub-horizontal layer, then it must be exposed somewhere on either side of the mountain. So that's what those trenches were doing. We just walked to the sides of the mountain and said, well, let's see if we can find it, and, and we found it. But that's just, and that little area down there is really exciting, but it's just a small part of that limestone scarn uh, modelled layer. So that's really exciting, but the potential, this blue layer in this image here, could be enormous. It, it goes on and on and on to the to the west and then bends around the topography and then um, should, it, should be exposed in the north as well. So whilst we're drilling in this area, and that's exciting enough in, in its own right, the potential is, is significant and we will be exploring um, uh, that with early 